Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Do Good to Lead Well webinar and podcast series. My name is Craig Dowden, and I'm the host of the Do Good to Lead Well podcast, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. For those of you who are new to the program, very special welcome. Awesome to have you with us. For those of you who are return attendees, live attendees, and or listeners to the podcast, great to have you back. I always love to set the stage in terms of where the idea for this podcast came about. So it really uh, started in advance of the publication of my first book, Do Good to Lead Well, The Science and Practice of Positive Leadership. And I have the profound privilege to speak with best-selling authors, TED speakers, global thought leaders, top CEOs in my day-to-day -day work. And what I wanted to do was broaden that conversation to a larger community. And when COVID, the global pandemic came upon us, just really put that on rocket fuel. And over the last several years, I have interviewed well over 75 phenomenal guests and extraordinary individuals, executives, and experts um, in terms of their, in their work and their experience. And I also want to say, before we start the conversation, I'm so looking forward to diving in with, with Paul this afternoon. I've been keenly <laughs> excited about this for quite some time. I want to send a very special thank you to everybody here uh, for supporting the Do Good to Lead Well podcast. As you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, because of your ongoing support, your encouragement, your feedback, your sharing, your liking of the podcast, we are now rated in the top 1% of all podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes. So again, you've just been absolutely phenomenal. Love everything that you do and share with me and our guests. It's just been an extraordinary privilege to be a part of this. And as I mentioned, the reason that we've receive such wonderful feedback is because of the extraordinary people I have the privilege to speak with and you have the privilege to interact with through the chat function. And today, as I said, this is such a, a, a wonderfully topical uh, area. I mean, everywhere you look, AI, algorithms, machine learning, it's almost like you can't pivot your head and, and not see it. And the speed of technological advancement that's currently underway and seems to continue to accelerate has created tremendous excitement and also fear at the same time. So this is why I feel incredibly fortunate to welcome Dr. Paul Leonardi, the author of The Digital Mindset, What It Really Takes to Thrive in the Age of Data, Algorithms, and AI, to the Do Good to Lead Well podcast. His book, and I've got a copy here, it is fabulous, I cannot old school and you'll see as well go to any page and I love the highlighting so you see it's absolutely stacked with with great information his book dives into two decades worth of research into the skills that lead to performance and innovation in today's workplace and Paul has consulted with lots of top organizations and institutions and the book is peppered with great stories and insights and data uh, at UC Santa Barbara Dr. Leonardi is chair of the technology management department whose programs are all aimed to teaching engineers and other technical leaders how to build and run innovative companies. In addition to his extensive speaking and consulting work, he has published over 80 articles and chapters in peer reviewed journals and management outlets, including Harvard Business Review, Sloan Management Review. He's also the author of three books on innovation and organizational change and and this is just part of the bio, <laughs> he has won major awards for his research, including from very well-respected esteemed organizations like the Academy of Management and the American Sociological Association. So without further ado, Paul, warm, warm welcome to the program. It's absolutely awesome to have you here. Thanks so much, Craig. I'm really excited to be here and to talk with you today. Well, and and you've been doing this work for, for quite some time, and I'd love to hear, so what got you interested in this whole space? You are a pilot, you were seeing around the corner uh, long before we are where we are. So what was it that sparked your interest in this, in this particular research domain? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question. You know, many, 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 many moons ago, I had a first job in public relations, and I... 
I loved the job for some reasons and I really detested it for others. So it didn't last all that long, but I, I was working in, in San Francisco. It was the height of the, the internet boom in the late nineties. And I was charged with doing research on all of these companies to figure out how do we position our clients that are doing you know, B2B technology work basically against competitors. And I just got really excited about all of these new tools and the way they were shaping our economy and how they were you know, portending change for regular organizations and the way that people worked. And what occurred to me as I was doing a lot of this research in these early days was that there weren't a lot of people in management at the time talking about how to enroll technology to make their organizations better. Everybody that we talked to for on behalf of our clients was in IT. And so we, we were always, you know, sort of pitching to the converted, right? That like, we have this great tool and, and won't it be useful for you? And they would say, yes, we could see how it fits into our stack and how it, you know, how it would make work better. But we rarely had conversations that were strategic with high level leaders about how technology might drive change that you care about in your organizations. And so I wondered why, why is that the case and why aren't big uh, you know, information-based tools more on leaders' radar for how they could improve work or change strategic direction of our organization or reshape our business models? And so those questions got me wanting to go to graduate school and to try to do some of this kind of research. And that's really where it started. And so I've spent now lots of time with many companies in all kinds of different industries trying to understand this pattern and how technology helps us and in which cases it hurts us. Well, and, and I love that. And for me, with my own background, you know, pursuing a PhD in psychology and business, I just love what I really value and appreciate throughout the book. And again, as I said, it's exceptional. I love it. Is that through your extensive consulting experience, you share really powerful stories about that application and some of the key questions and issues you wanna think about. And that at the same time, you're able to bring in just fascinating research, your own or elsewhere, that really shines a light on it and builds an evidence-based case for it. And one yeah. thing that I do, and I encourage all live audience members, please chime in with your questions uh, for Paul. I love the title like the digital mindset and and i'd love to hear i have my own thoughts around yeah. that i'd love for you to share what prompted you to frame the book in that way mindset sure it was a pretty simple decision in the end and it the reason that it arose was because we had been talking with so many different leaders who were asking us about what skills do our employees need to have to be successful and also what skills do they need to have to be successful in the digital economy? And Sadal and I would come up with lists of things that we thought people should do. And they would say, okay, well, that's helpful. We'll get our L&D teams to you know, whip up some courses around this, or we'll contract with the local university to help get us up to speed in these areas. Um, and then they would often say, okay, well, good. Well, we're done. We'll just go do those things. But what we know from having worked with so many companies is that it's not just about having skills. You have to be able to think differently to affect the kind of change that you want in your organization. And what digital tools, any, any kind of technology, right, does for us is it provides us with new capabilities that we didn't have before or allows us the possibility of doing old things in new ways. And you have to be able to envision how might my work change or how might my organization adapt given the possibility of these new capabilities? And it's that thinking, it's that mindset that really is the most powerful. Um, one of the things though that it, we try to convey in the book is that it's really hard to have a digital mindset if you don't have the skill set though, mm -hmm. because knowing how to how AI works, right? Knowing how you know, convolutional neural networks operate, right? And how data are parsed, at least at a high level, allow you to say, I think I know what this new crazy chat GPT tool could do in my organization, right? Because I know generally how it works. So having that skill set enables you to have a mindset, but they're not the same thing. Um, and so 
I'm always pushing leaders to think about, you know, you've got to think about what's the tool set in your organization, right? What are the different kinds of applications that are going to allow us to work in the way we want to? Do we have the right skill set to use that tool set? That's where training comes in. And then are we encouraging our employees and are we creating a culture that allows the right mindset so that we could take advantage of the skills for the tools that we're using? That's really where this idea of mindset comes from. Thank you. And so many positive comments already and love that. And and to me, and maybe, and I'm, I'm curious if I've overextended this, it almost reminded me of the Southwest, right? Hire for attitude, yeah. train for skill that, and that's something that right away just brought me in that it's, well, in order for us to truly capitalize, and I love how you just described it, Paul, like the tools that are mm -hmm. that are available to us and think about how it applies. We've got to have that foundational mindset. Have I overextended that or is it kind of that extension of the Southwest? Oh, uh, no, I think you're exactly right. And let me give you a, a concrete example that I think illustrates this point and, and the connection between the two. So I, I had a relationship with a company that was uh, building a, a SaaS B2C product. And one of the big complaints that the senior level executives had was that, you know, we were doing a really good job in our hiring to make sure that we're bringing in people with a bunch of diverse viewpoints. You know, they're cognitively diverse, they're racially diverse, they're diverse on the age spectrum. Right? We've got a really well-rounded team. But whenever we're making decisions as an organization, it seems like there's a few people that always dominate in the conversations. So we've got good diversity, but we don't have a lot of inclusion. And so they made a big charge across the organization to all the directors, VPs, and below to say, how do we increase our ability to be inclusive in decision making? One of the, um, the product leaders in the organization thought about this for a while and had what I would consider a really strong digital mindset, right? So that ability to, to think and was hired for that reason, right? Um, you know, just like you said in the Southwest example. And he, um, he recognized that, you know, much of the interaction on his teams was taking place via Zoom. And so he thought, well, I, I know how Zoom works, right? Like I've got the skill set to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And I know how they create logs of these conversations. And I know that those are time stamped. And so what if I could get an API into the tool and so I could start getting snippets of conversation that's happening across my team whenever somebody's meeting. And then I could create a, a real basic statistical analysis to look at how often are people participating, who's cutting each other off, who's most central to the conversation flow. And that would give me an example of whether people are being included in decision making. So he did just that. He found that there were huge asymmetries. He presented that to, um, you know, back to the team and the teams went, whoa, we had no idea, right? I, I didn't know I was such a blowhard, right? Or I didn't know I was being so quiet and that I should be speaking up more. And it really changed the way that the teams operated. But how did he get there? That he had the skill set to know what was happening, right? How these different tools work. And he had the mindset to think about how do I apply it in a whole different area from which it was designed to make a positive impact in my organization. That's a digital mindset. I love that. And love that linkage that you make. And also the separation, as you say, they're not the same thing. Right. And together, they're extraordinarily powerful. Hugely. Um, it's the combination. It's like the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in there. That I love that. I've got a question already, and yeah. this is uh, I'm not surprised. So Arthur was saying, I kind of feel like I'm at a stage in my career where the digital mindset has passed me. Like, do I have any hope? <laughs> Oh, Love Arthur, absolutely, um, absolutely. One of the things that we uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about is what what level of technical proficiency or technical competence do you need to get to in order to really feel comfortable and conversant in the digital world, right? And to develop that digital mindset. And we we started asking this question because a lot of people would say to us, well, do I need to learn how to program? You know, do I need to be proficient in Python? Do I need to understand, you know, how to do a SQL query, right? Like all of these technical things. And the answer is pretty much no. And I say pretty much no, because of course there's always exceptions, but we, we liken this to second language learning. So in the workplace, 
um, you know, there's a lot of research done by linguists and cross-cultural psychologists that suggest that to be really proficient in an English speaking workplace, you need to know about 3,500 words of English. 12,000 words is roughly native level uh, you know, fluency, but you don't need to be a native speaker or even approach a native speaker to be conversationally powerful in the workplace. You just need to know roughly 30%. And that analogy works really well for the digital mindset that you don't need to know how to code in Python but you do need to understand a bit about what are some of the differences maybe between different programming languages that are being used in that part of my organization, or need to know a little bit about how an application like Zoom operates behind the scenes so that you could develop that way of thinking that allows you to expand your set of possibilities. The good news is you don't need to go back to school and learn to be a computer scientist. I think you can get there pretty easily by you know, taking some online courses, many of those are for free, right? LinkedIn Learning offers lots of courses about prompt engineering for ChatGPT and, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, video-based applications like Zoom and Teams and, and GoToMeeting work. So there are easy ways of just learning about different tools to get you to that 30%. And much of the way we wrote the book is designed to help people get there as well. No, and thank you. And I smiled when I saw the question because that was something early in the book uh -huh. It was interesting as, as I was diving in, I was kind of going, okay, <laughs> how much, how much of this, you know, how deeply do I have to know how the sausage is made, if you right. will, in terms of that. And I loved how you framed it about, well, you want to understand what's going on. You want to have enough knowledge and insight such that, okay, you, under, you know how to understand what prompting looks like or what this tool can do and how it works. And then start to, again, bring that mindset. And that's why I love the title. Mm -hmm. Now take that in that insight. Now translate it into something whereby you can look at how do you enhance your indiv individual effectiveness? How do you make collaboration more effective? How do you bring it to team dynamics? Or as you've given some great examples, I just love that. I think it's yeah. such a and it's also an empowering <laughs> perspective. Yeah, very empowering. And we all need to be technically conversant in today's organizations. You know, we if we're not then key decisions are going to pass us by. And I think that one of the key ways to get there is to have um, you know, a bit of humility and to say, I, I don't know these things and it's okay. I, nobody ever told me I needed to and I didn't need to up until this point, but I do now. So what are the steps I need to take to learn how to be conversational? Because I need to be involved in those important conversations. Well, and I love that you just shone the light on humility. Uh, because also um, have that's been a constant thread to s several of the CEOs who <laughs> the program. Yeah. We had Daryl Van Tonger in his great book, Humble, such oh, yeah. a focus on this. And I, I'm with you 130% in terms of we have to recognize, embrace what we don't know and see it as a learning opportunity how we can grow and develop and enhance ourselves. And also to your point, which I think can get lost, is that, well, if we're gonna resist reality, if you will, well, things, decisions are gonna pass us by, mm -hmm. opportunities are gonna pass us by. So now for us, it's so how do we learn to best function in this digital transformative environment? So yeah. I, a, another question, there's so many great insights throughout throughout your book. Uh, one that I love and hit home with me, um, and also a part of different uh, conversations I've uh, I've been in, is how you highlight them. When we collaborate with machines, it's entirely different than when we <laughs> collaborate with other humans. Yet, and I know I, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> like, why is this not working? It's. Can you talk a little bit more about that? For me, it was almost wow. That's such a how obvious and powerful thing, and I've fallen for this, where you just go, well, how come the machine isn't working the way I think it should? Right, well, there's there's been several decades worth of research into exactly this question, and the findings are, you know, sort of unilateral, and that is that almost all tools that we interact with that have some kind of conversational user interface are designed to trick us into interacting as though it were with another person and that our the success of our 
our interaction with tools that you know operate in this way is very much tied to us resisting that draw and to remembering that we are interacting with a tool that is a, a rules-based prediction machine. And what it can't do, even though it might give us the sense that it could, is read the context. Yeah. And this is hugely important. And I'll just give you two really quick examples. So way back in the 1960s, there was a computer scientist at MIT who developed a, a program that was based on Rogerian psychology, a software program called ELISA. And it, it was a great program because it just basically took in snippets from what you asked, rephrased them, again, using the prompts of Rogerian psychology, which is all about kind of repeating what, what you said and getting you to reflect on it. And you could have a conversation in, in the 1960s, right, in text uh, with Eliza. And um, you know, some of the early studies that were done showed that people really thought there was somebody behind the machine talking with them because Eliza appeared so human-like. And so they would divulge lots of information and secrets and all of these things, but Eliza could never engage with them in the right ways. Fast forward right now to 2023, we have ChatGPT, we have Bard, we have Claude, right? You know, pick your, uh, your most popular one or the one you like the best. And they do largely the same thing, although in a much more sophisticated way based on lots more data and on hugely uh, impressive prediction algorithms. Mm -hmm. But what they can't understand is the context around what it is we're asking and why. And that's difficult because as humans, we assume, we have evolved in our communication to assume that other people know things in common to us that we don't have to communicate. And if we fail to communicate exactly what we want, how we want it, in what way, then we get answers that are not useful for us or the machine does things that we don't want it to do because it can't understand what we're asking. All it can do is essentially make predictions about what it thinks we're asking based on the text that we've given it. And that's so important to remember because it, it then requires of us to be extremely detailed and extremely basic in, in atomizing our, our questions, right? And, and atomizing our requests so that everything happens as a step that's very well spelled out. And I think it's gonna take us several years before we, we can move on from this, but the reality that we're in makes it seem like, hey, I've got like a other person on the other side of me and they should be able to understand it just as well as you could. <laughs> well, it, 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 when I think about it, this, I am again, lots of great comments, awesome answer, yeah. love the discussion. So thank you, Paul. And it, and it, and it does remind me, it's almost like this interesting application of self-serving bias where it's like, oh, yeah. I, I know what I'm trying to say. And then I'm frustrated that you aren't responding, another human. And it's almost like this fascinating parallel application to your point, whereby in that prompting, it's really just going to reply to whatever I put in. And it was such a powerful insight is just, of course. And now what it does is put heightened responsibility on me as the communicator to ensure that I'm unpacking that in a way that, ah, uh, here are the things that, and I even wonder aloud about how might that improve human to human communication, let alone human to machine. Yeah, and we we talk about that human to human part in the, the second chapter of our book, where we focus on uh, this concept of digital presence and how you establish that. Because as you point out, one of the key things that happens in our human to human situations is, we often do share context and enough that we can make relatively reliable interpretations about what the other person needs or wants or is interested in. But in the context of remote work, right, where we're distributed from one another in, in geography and also often in time zone, it's much more difficult for us to get on the same page in terms of that context. And you know, you can just probably think of the many examples that you've had where you know you you're running late to a meeting. And, or you've, you know, like, yeah, you, let's say you're running late to a meeting and the person that gets on is all upset with you because you're late. Well, if you had been meeting with them in the office, they would know that there was a traffic jam on Highway 101 and that everybody was late into the office today, but they don't know that. That's the context, right? So 
we have to be more deliberate and more strategic about communicating our context with other people, even when we're uh, you know, working face to face, but very, very much so when we're working in remote contexts where um, you know, the shared context is lacking. And that's the same kind of principle we're talking about, but with ChatGPT and other AI-based tools, that shared context is always lacking. Right, I love that. And again, it's a powerful reminder again about, okay, so what my place is in this dynamic, this interaction, no matter who's on the other end of the line. Absolutely. Uh, so I've got another question. So again, they keep coming in. Yeah, uh, so Rana says, great conversation, love this. Um, so given that every organization has a digital transformation agenda <laughs> and need to innovate, what have you seen are the biggest mistakes organizations make while aiming to be innovative in this area? It's a great question and your observation is spot on. Every organization has some digital transformation agenda these days and innovation is a top priority. So you're not going crazy. It is absolutely everywhere. I think that there are, there are a few mistakes. The biggest one though is believing that a digital transformation or a digital change initiative is something that really happens at the senior levels of the organization. And the reason I think this is a mistake is that where organizations actually change is at the level of the individual contributor, the teams, the mid-level managers that are actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. And they have to be able to identify ways of using our new tools, opportunities, right, for uh, efficiency if we use a new digital platform or AI tool um, in order for our organizations to change. And so much of the effective digital transformation happens from the bottom up. It bubbles from the bottom rather than is pushed down from the top. What the top does is tells us we need to make changes in these areas and will support you by implementing some tools that are going to enable the change that we want. But the top doesn't always know how and where those tools could be the most useful, how they should be used, and what consequences of using them might really result for the company. So it's really, really essential for senior leaders to be in, in very close conversation and connection with people that are actually on the ground doing the work and to be listening to them about areas where they find that there are efficiencies to be gained or there's better communication that's going to happen or there are redundancies that can be eliminated or areas that we can move into that will add value to the organization if we don't have to be doing these other things that don't add value. And that disconnect right between senior senior level executives and the people on the ground is one of the big, big places where I think that a lot of digital transformation really fails. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll pause there and see if you have questions before I dive into my well, next. Well, absolutely. I think it's, uh, it, it, I love what you're saying and, in, and particularly in terms of the level of altitude, shall yeah. we say, and the assumptions that people have within it. All right, we'll go this, go do this. And I really appreciate how in the book as well, you talk about the importance of purpose, like intention and intention and what, and I love those examples you provided. Okay, how are we going to uh, gain from, from the adoption of these tools? And if we're not having an open dialogue around that, and I love the bottom up approach where it's yeah. getting people engaged around it, well, just like change management, well, that's, that's gonna be difficult. I've got another question. Um, from Carlos saying, in my organization, there's a healthy dose of fear around AI and yes. technology. Right. And so any advice around how to acknowledge, navigate that, those, that emotion of, of fear, which is really heavily entrenched? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a fantastic question. And it's unfortunate that there is so much fear, but it's completely understandable. Um, from a historical perspective, it's predictable, right? Anytime we see new advanced tools entering the workplace, people are concerned. And they're concerned for good reason because lots of history has shown us that when, you know, senior leaders see an opportunity to save costs, they're going to do it. And if they can automate, they're going to do it. Despite 
rhetoric to the contrary, right? That no, no, we're, we really value our employee work base and so on and so forth. Um, especially in public companies where shareholder pressures for profitability are so high, you know, especially now, right, in this economic downturn um, where you can't just have great revenue, you need to have profits, right, in order to, to be successful. There's that fear is real and it's pal palpable. Um, I think there are a couple ways, in, especially in the domain of AI, to, to deal with this. So the first is kind of almost related to what we just talked with, which is about helping empower our employees to make sense out of how we use AI in the workplace. And if there was any tool that was custom made, it would seem, to help empower employees to do this work, it should be AI. Right. And the reason is that, you know, if I'm a CIO or the CTO, right, of a company, and I say, we, we're going to implement this new AI-based tool in, in, our, in our work for our employees uh, because it does this. It will do that today, but by the time they actually get it implemented, it will have already evolved to do something else. That's the, the magic of machine learning, right? Is that these tools aren't perfected by developers, bought by our companies, and then implemented. They are always beta versions that are put into our organizations and are learning from our data, the data of others, and constantly evolving. So the tool that we have today is not the tool we will have tomorrow. So it's really foolhardy to think, I know what AIs, how AI is gonna change my organization because we don't even know what AI we have anymore. So if you recognize that, then it almost compels you to ask your employees to work with these tools, right? And figure out what they're good for, where they can be potentially useful and to make proposals to us as more senior leaders, right, about where we could be creating value in the organization. Mm. Now, you might be skeptical and say, okay, well, great, I could do that, but if the value is that 50% of my work can now be automated, why don't they just, you know, fire me and one other person and we cut headcount in half in our organization? Well, the beauty, I think, of learning how to use AI tools is figuring out what are the areas that we could move into, right? And this goes back to our mindset, that we things that we can do that we couldn't do before. Well, now that 50% of my work, and I'll give you an example from a company I work with, uh, um, sort of marketing, um, it's a big marketing company. And a big part of what they do is try to understand, you know, what does the competitive landscape look like so we can generate the right kind of marketing messages and marketing collateral for our clients. And a lot of time is really spent on pulling data, trying to analyze the market, seeing patterns, and there's not a lot of time left for the marketing analysts to try to develop anything new. Because they're trying, they're so uh, so busy trying to figure out what's what now. Well, they've been using a, a Chat GPT-like tool now for about a year, and what they find is that the tool is really good at doing a lot of high-level summary of what's out there, and also making predictions of what might your text look like, you know, to to captivate people's attention in a more personalized way. But all that all that is doing is relying on data that was out there, so it's never truly innovative. Right. What what that automation has freed up is time for these junior level um, account executives to now start thinking more broadly and more creatively about how do we create a new kind of campaign that really differentiates us from the competition. We know what that competition is because it, the AI has helped us to generate a, a lay of the land. Now our job can be deepening our knowledge and our expertise in how to do this competitive positioning work. Mm -hmm. Now, that only can happen, though, if our leadership is willing to be flexible about what our roles look like. Right. And if you think about it, all of our roles are just the, comp you know, the compilation of a whole bunch of different tasks that we do. And if AI takes away some of those tasks, then we have the opportunity to change our role by taking on new tasks. If we want our employees to not be fearful, we have to be more flexible in thinking about what roles look like, give them the opportunity to experiment, to try new things out, and then to deepen their expertise or upskill in certain areas that allow them to re-envision roles. 
that's how we help people not be fearful. And I think ultimately that's how we add value in our organizations as well. Well, I love that. And again, uh, so many positive comments, great answer, great insight, awesome story. Um, it, I, I reflect on my own conversations in my coaching practice and elsewhere. And what's really intriguing to me is the, the framing question, right? Stepping back and saying, okay, so where can AI add tremendous value in what we do? And then what opportunities does that open up? So to your point, exactly. and I you know with the client organizations where they're like, hey, some of the more mundane, shall we say, rote uh, procedural work, well, can just power through that almost instantaneously. Then what it does is free people up to do the more complex projects, challenges, questions, and engage more so that they're more engaged. And then also, the the efficiency of the other work where AI is now being applied is just off the charts. So then, rather than it being a threat, it's actually it's it's adding value and opens up different type of work, exactly as you're talking about, Paul. Yeah. One consideration though um, that I've seen now a number of in a number of different places is that if there are new areas, like it's really obvious, especially at the you know, at the more um, entry level jobs within our organizations. If there's new areas that we could be moving into um, that we now have time for because AI has automated, you know, a number of tasks, then it's an easy sell. Where it becomes more difficult is if the next logical thing that the person at the bottom of the hierarchy would do is take on some of the work of the person just above them. This is where things start to get a little more challenging because you end up with this problem of, you know, sort of infinite scaling, right? Where if, if I take a few of the tasks away from my boss, then my boss is left with fewer tasks. So she has to take away fewer, you know, tasks from her boss. And at some point you reach a level in the organization where somebody's like, uh-uh, I'm not giving up my work or I don't know what I could do next. And I don't know what I could do differently. And they put a stop on the whole upward progression of skill and, you know, sort of the upskilling of work. And that's a real problem. I think that for our long-term success and happiness and, and, and our really productivity in our organizations, the most creativity is going to need to happen at the middle of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. So once, once you get above, right, you know, director, senior director level, then you're off sort of in the realm of corporate strategy, right? And you're doing a lot of the high level negotiation work that needs to happen in the organization but you're still managing people and managing work at the director level and below. And if we can't think about how to expand the work that our teams are doing and think about what, would, what could I do to add value as a director, senior director in my organization, then we're never gonna let that innovation bubble up from the bottom. And so I think that's where, that's where my biggest concern is, is that it's, it's the sort of the fat middle of our organizations that won't be able to be creative enough or won't be given the opportunity to be creative enough to let everybody else's skills rise. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's my biggest area of concern at the moment. And I love, again, I love that it link, it's links back to our discussion around humility and ego, I guess, <laughs> yeah, where it's like, true. hey, don't take my job, you know, or don't, so it's fine elsewhere as long as it's not in my backyard. And mm -hmm. I, I, I empathize and agree with your point around, well, if we don't have the mind fact, the mindset yeah. around, okay, expanding it and looking at it as a, a philosophy of abundance, if you will, then we can really be, we can create lots of inertia within, within the organization. I have another great question from Tara, who was, was wondering, you know, how can leaders, managers, give their employees time, space to be able to learn and grow and gain the insight from these tools. So, because where things are evolving so quickly. So any thoughts around how to be more intentional about creating those learning opportunities? Yeah, I think that uh, companies need to be much more um, explicit and make some structural change in order for this to happen. We can't just be telling our employees, well, you should figure out how to use this and you should go out and do it. We need to provide opportunities for that learning. Um, I've worked with a number of different organizations of different sizes and you know, different levels of revenue and, and, and different scales uh, that have done this differently, but all of whom have been successful. So for uh, I'll give you the basic example and then move up. So 
Um, I worked with a, a public um, planning agency and they were implementing some AI-based tools for urban planners and GIS modelers. And, you know, they don't have a lot of resources. They're not a huge organization. But what they recognized was that they needed to give people the opportunity to go take different kinds of classes online that would allow them to build their skills. And so they built into the work week an expectation that you would be spending somewhere, depending on your level, between two and four hours a week building skills in areas related to the new tools that we were using. And they, they provided a list of courses that were easily accessible online, right? Some from Udacity, from LinkedIn Learning, right? From, from other places that just gave really easy primers on how to build skills in these new areas. But they institutionalized this as a, as a formal practice, right? You should be spending between two and four hours a week going and doing these courses. And they were asked to report, you know, what courses that they did and, you know, uh, in their, their one-on-ones with the leader, the, their managers, right, to talk about what things are you learning in those courses and what applicability does it have to our work. And that was a really easy and a good way of allowing people to start upskilling. But it took that formal policy to make people actually do it. Because once you, when they started, they said, well, you should just go out and spend some time doing this and here's a list of courses. And nobody felt like it was a legitimate enough request to take time out of their work to do it. And nobody really wanted to do it outside the work. And so it just wasn't getting done. So you had to create space for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, a bigger company that I worked with, you know, uh, multiple thousands of employees, did an audit, and I, I helped them to do this, to figure out, well, what are the areas where we need to build that skill set so that our employees have the right mindset? And we identified four or five key areas that were common across multiple functions, and then several areas in each of the functions that were more unique. And I worked with their learning and development teams to talk about what would be the should be the content of these kinds of courses. And then they went out and they built them. I didn't have, uh, you know, much of a, a hand in that, but I, you know, they asked me to look at them and give them some tips on, you know, are we going in the right way? But they built these courses and they found instructors, some internal, some external to come and teach these courses. Mm -hmm. And one of the companies even created a, you know, an exam about AI readiness that employees needed to pass, um, you know, in order to be successful in their next promotion. And, mm -hmm. But they were being given the courses by the L&D instructors and you could retake the course. There was no, like if you didn't get it the first time, there was no penalty to go back and do it again. You just needed to demonstrate that you had confidence in this area. And so we gave you the coursework to do it. So those represent two very different ways that an organization that's much larger, more formal, more resources, and one that is much less formal, fewer resources can do to try to really instantiate this learning. Mm, love and so and so great comments great ideas love the different examples paul so so many wonderful uh comments here uh in 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 the box and and i love as you say it's the intentionality around it it's the carving out the time because otherwise it's very easy to fill up our schedule our time Absolutely. with incoming requests and i just really appreciate that no matter what sector size whatever you're doing just looking at okay how can we be more thoughtful about dedicating that time and also embedded i love how you're sharing hey this is part of our ongoing not just here are the courses and here's the time tell us what you've done tell us what you've learned here's how it feeds into your career and your opportunities all so so powerful i've uh, got another question uh, as well time's flying i can't believe it's almost oh, it's, it's, already. it's awesome um so vahara at uh, another great question so Paul, do you think people have to be uh, smarter or more intelligent now than in the past in order to thrive in a digital environment? And who will be the losers if you don't keep up? <laughs> I don't think people need to be smarter. I think that they need to be more self-aware mm. than ever. Yeah. Um, there are so many more skill sets that we need today than we did a decade ago or two decades ago. I think it was 
you know, fairly reasonable to expect that if you were hired into a company in a non-technical function, you know, 15 years ago, you didn't really need to know about what the organization's uh, data platform looked like. You know, that was somebody else's issue um, and somebody else's domain. What we see now is that so much of the competitive advantage of almost any business is based on the kind of data that they produce and collect and utilize that it's everybody's job to understand what kind of data do we have and how could I use that in my work? So it's not that that's harder to do necessarily, but it's a different kind of skill than we typically might think it would be associated with the kind of role that I have. Mm. Similarly, you could make an argument, or maybe conversely, uh, you could make the argument that people that are in more technical functions um, didn't used to have to be able to explain very much about what they did and how and why, because nobody was interested. Now, you have to imagine that if you are in you know, your data science organization, that you're going to have people from across the organization coming to you and not just wanting you to help them, but to understand the why of what you're doing and the how of what you're doing. And you're going to have to be able to explain that in a language that is good enough for that non-native speaker to be able to understand. And that was not something that you had to do in those kinds of roles before. So what we're seeing is that there's an expansion and an evolution of our skill set. And why I say we need to be more self-aware is that we need to recognize areas where we're deficient. I don't think any of this is really difficult to learn. It's just that we haven't ever thought that we had to, so we never tried. But if we're a little more self-aware about where these, these areas are, then we can start to devote some time and attention to building out those skill sets so that we have that mindset. Well, and again, thank you. Great insights, amazing insights. Thank you, Paul. Such a great conversation. And, and for myself, one of the many privileges that I feel and, and have in terms of hosting this podcast series is just, I love the themes that that spread across and what mm -hmm. you're touching on. And this, and one of the many reasons your book spoke to me is that it just beautifully overlays core themes that continue to come out. And you talked about self-awareness again, anybody the last, you know, over the last year, two years, especially with the, the global pandemic, a key insight people continually share Best-selling authors, thought leaders, CEO, self-awareness, self-awareness, self-awareness. Got to right. be aware of me. Got to be aware of my environment. Got to be aware of where I have hold, have strength. Got to be aware of where I have, where I have gaps. And another point, and I want to tie this back because uh, was a recent guest on the program episode coming out soon. We had the privilege of having the chief statistician of Canada on. So I'd love to get your take wow. on this. And what was really cool, so their whole organization, one of the most complex, sophisticated statistical agencies in the world, and he was talking about the importance that every single one of us, global citizens, must become much more astute consumers of data and understand data and to be able, and I was, when I got that, you know, they're all throughout the book and when I got to the chapter around data and, and data literacy, and, and as you talked about that, I'd love for you to get your take on that. I mean, this is the chief statistician of Canada and mm. presents internationally saying every person must get more conversant in statistics and data and, and all of the, what are your, what are your thoughts uh, on, uh, on that? I couldn't agree more. We are in a world that is powered by data. It runs on data. Nobody's making decisions without looking at data. The questions that we need to be able to ask are, are our data crap? Yeah. Like, are our data good? Are those the right data to be making decisions? What is left out of the data that we have that we should be recognizing as left out so that we don't you know, left sensor or right sensor our decisions in particular directions? So, for that reason, we devoted a whole chapter on data and ways to think about data and questions to ask about data. And I'll just give you the punchline of that chapter right now, which is that data are not something that exists out there waiting to be found. Data are produced, right? We, every number 
that we touch is a number that has been massaged and, and, and changed and combined and manipulated. And our job is to understand, when anybody tells us, well, this is based on data, is to know what kind of data that is that our decision is being based on so that we can ask the questions what, that I just mentioned. So that's extremely important. But also having a, a basic knowledge of statistical concepts and statistical reasoning is really, really important. And statistics are hard. You know, like most of us, when we took math classes at you know high school and in the university, statistics are tough. Like I didn't do a great job in my statistics class, undergrad or even in grad school. It took me a while to, to really get there. Um, and uh, you know, Kahneman and Traversky won the Nobel Prize for talking about how humans are really, really bad at probabilistic thinking. It's just not something that comes natural to us. And that's what statistics are all about. They're all about probabilities. So we, we wrote a chapter that's, I kind of joke, it's called Drunks and Lampposts uh, in the book, but I joke it's, it's like Statistics 101 um, or even a dumber version of that because you don't really need to understand, I don't think, to get to our 30%, you know, what a plus on regression is and exactly what, you know, what the math is. But what you do need to understand is when somebody says that they ran this kind of analysis to know, is that the right kind of analysis? And if they tell you this result is significant, how do we have confidence that that result is significant in the way we care about? First, you need to understand the data to be able to even you know, have any kind of confidence in the outcomes of statistics, but then we need to understand the language of statistics so that we can use them, question them, and even doubt them when appropriate. It is absolutely, absolutely essential. And even more importantly, as we're moving very swiftly into this AI age, Every word that you see chat GPT, every letter that you see chat GPT put onto that screen is the result of some statistical prediction process that's going on behind the scenes. So not only do we have to think at a bigger scale about statistics and, and decision making, but we need to recognize that all the tools that we're using are operating from a probabilistic logic. They're using statistics and we need to embrace that and understand it. And it's just another dialect that we need to learn to speak. Uh, for sure. And I love this. And again, so many great comments coming in. And it, it again, it reminds me so much of conversations that I've had around. It's almost like taking that a hypothesis testing approach to life, like approaching life like a scientist to your mm -hmm. and just and our interactions as scientists. So we have hypotheses as opposed to absolute truths. And so once we can, you know, unanchor ourselves, if you will, from that, well, I've got the, now it just broadens that perspective. And now it's just each time it's like, all right, I'm going to keep gathering data. I'm going to keep testing hypotheses and see, does this pan out? And it's just such a freeing approach uh, to, for all of our interactions, personal and professional. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, so love this again. Thank you. So, so great. Can you be. talk about psychological safety um and and that's getting and understandably so a lot of attention so you can talk a little bit about that within the confines of a digital transformation exercise yeah well i think psychological safety undergirds a lot of what you and i have discussed in this last hour together um you know that i've made lots of recommendations about how we need to recognize that digital change bubbles up from the bottom that we need to be empowering employees to make sure that they are finding areas of you know, usefulness and utility for different tools, how they should be talking to their managers about new ways that they can add value. Well, you can only do that in an organization that has a degree of trust and a degree of psychological safety where you can you feel like it's okay to make those kinds of proclamations, right? And you feel like it's okay to try something out and see whether it works. Not all organizations are like that still, even though we've heard for decades now about the importance of psychological safety in our companies. So yeah, so much of what I suggest presumes that you've built a culture of psychological safety. I think it's especially important when we're asking employees to do some experimentation, 
right? To try things out because experiment means we don't know, right? It means we're trying it to see whether it's going to work or not. And that entails the huge possibility and in fact, the likelihood that failure is going to happen. And, and this is why Amy Edmondson, right, who's one of the pioneering researchers in, in psychological safety, you know, her, her new book that's just coming out or is out in the next couple of days, uh, The Right Kind of Wrong, is all about this idea of how do we fail better. And we have to be empowering our, our employees to be doing this kind of experimentation work with these tools. That's part of having a digital mindset, right, is, is recognizing that as a leader, I don't know everything. I need to help help my employees figure out how to learn. And at a more individual contributor level, that, that digital mindset is, I need to figure out what the best way of using this is. I need to figure out what the best order of operations is. And then I need to make those kinds of arguments to uh, the leaders in my organization. So we've got a whole chapter in the book about experimentation that touches on these issues because how you think about cultivating a culture that embraces this idea of experimentation is so key. And psychological safety is absolutely the driver to make that experimentation work. And, and uh, again, I love that we're talking about this because it is, it's, it's integral. And the point yeah. that you made that I find just gets so often lost is that, well, if we're looking to be innovative, if we're looking to drive transformation, and we're going to be experimenting with things. Well, guess what? Are we going to walk up and hit a home run or get a hundred? Of course not. And yet, again, if we manage it in that way, if we lead in that way, well, what are people going to do? They're going to do the stuff we've always done because that's the yeah. safe one, the right. safe option. We're not going to experiment. So I love that focus in the book as well as about, hey, all these things are so powerful and again, it's the common thread for me that I just so appreciated that you continue to bring the reader back to time and time again, is that the mindset, the foundation upon which you build these things is essential. It's almost like the foundation of the house has to be solid in order to capitalize on all of this, because otherwise, no matter how great the tools, no matter how great the resources, we're just not gonna be able to do what we can do. And you inspire and challenge us to be better. <laughs> That's a great metaphor. And I would just end, the, end this little section by saying, you know, we can't just go out and fail all the time. Mm -hmm. Failure is important when we learn from it. And so we have to have procedures and processes in place that help us learn when we fail. Because then if we learn, then it's really not a failure, right? Because we didn't achieve our objective now, but we've created the opportunity to figure out how to do it better next time. And so we talk about things in the book, like how good companies create learning agendas that help them to do this. And that's just, it's so important. Well, thank you. This is just the, I can't believe it's an hour. Uh, so thank fast. you. Yeah, it went very fast and so many great comments. Yeah, thank um, you to everybody for all the great questions and comments. So I love it. It's like you're hosting a, an awesome dinner party. Uh, so uh, I always get a lot of I have so much joy out of it. Paul, this has been an absolute pleasure. Any final thoughts from you before we close uh, close this episode today? I would just remind everybody, you can do it. Like this is within within your grasp. And if you start with that self awareness about where where do I need to build the right skill set so that I can get to that mindset then your job is to make it happen. And I think it's really doable for everyone to get to that 30%. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And I would say, and if, you know, and this is a fabulous co-pilot <laughs> shining yep. that because it really <laughs> does. It does that foundational work of getting yourself ready, if you will, or continuing to expand your mindset, your philosophy, your approach uh, as we embark on the, this continued uh, journey. So, Paul, this has just been great. I keep getting flooded with comments. So, this was awesome. Thank you so, so much, everybody. Check out uh, Paul's fantastic book, The Digital Mindset, and stay tuned next week uh, on the program. I have Dr. Danika Guzni. She is the CEO of the Canadian Museum of Nature. She's coming in next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, and so I hope you can join us again. Until then, 
take care. Happy, you've got a great book for the Labor Day long weekend and look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Thanks so much, Paul. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye.